afternoon or is it? Yeah, or good morning still. So Hemingway Design, um, we're a multidisciplinary design agency. Uh, we design everything from big housing estates. We recently did, did the, the master plan and the vision for Dreamland in Margaret, which is a massive recycling project of a, a seafront um, amusement park. We're the creative directors of Unite Students, um, Europe's largest. So we work with FTSE 100 companies like that. We talked about we used to have a company called Red or Dead. Um, we even designed giant water butts in the shape of arses. We, <laughs> we, have a, we have a philosophy that design is about improving things that matter in life. So we never take on a project that's just about money. It's got to have, it's got to have a social uh, benefit. I suppose we've become pretty well known for sustainability, especially social uh, and economic su sustainability. We tend not to get bogged down in the science of environmental <coughs> sustainability and leave that to the, one, the ones that are, that are good at it. Um, but we, I think I was asked to kind of talk about how, how do we get people, you know, part of the talk they wanted me to say, how do we get people to, to respect recycling? How do we get people to think about the environment more? And, and, and really it's, you've, you've, got, you've got to live it. You've got to, the philosophy's got to go all the way through your company. And, and it has to come right from the top. So, for example, you know, it, we have fun with it all the time in Hemingway Design. We, we joke about the fact that me and Jerry Dean got the first Prius that came in the country, and I think that was 2002. It's now done 280,000. It's got sticky tape uh, uh, holding things on, black, black, you know, black gaffer tape. But we keep saying, right, okay, well, I'm 56 years old. The aim is to get that car through to when we're 70. And we probably will. You know, we... Nobody gets company cars. It's all you know. The only cars you can have is, is, is an old one. Uh, it, obviously, there's all the problems with emissions and things, but there isn't with the Prius to an extent. Um, we we have fun that when we go on on business trips, it, it is a competition to see who gets the most soaps, the most um, the, the, the most shampoos, and that and that's the stuff we have in the staff office. We never we, we we never would ever buy anything like that. It's got to come from hotels. We would never buy. We would, I don't think. I don't think we've bought cling film in, in in a long, long time because the shower caps from hotels completely do that job, and they've got a bit of elastic in them, so they last. You can wash them in. You can wash them in. in you know, wash them in, and use them again. Uh, and, and it and it and it goes on and on like that. We even. You know, we even have a. We've got two. You're allowed to bring your dog to our office, and we have two dogs that come every day. There's a thing that will. There's a rule that we'll never buy dog crap bags. You've got, you know, you've got to find something else, and then people have to be very creative to, to find something to pick the dog, the dog shit up from the garden outside the back of the office. But it, but if that's all going on all the time, you know, you absolutely know that people are not going to be wasteful, and they're going to think about it because it, it, it's fun and it's a laugh, and 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 I think when you get too po-faced about recycling, which I think the industry is often absolutely lacking in humour, then then you then you do have an issue because if you, Fun is, the, is, we're on this earth for, my granddad used to say, we're on this earth for three, three score and ten. Well, actually, now it's about four score, isn't it, that we're, up, that we're on here. Uh, and and you, should be, you should try and have as much fun when you do that. And, if, so, uh, and the environment should be part, environmental thinking should be totally and utterly fun. So when you're at work and you're, and you're thinking about, you're writing all of these things and you're thinking, does that sound fun or does it sound, could it, could it to somebody sound onerous? Which most of it does, I'm sorry, but most of the stuff that I read, I don't want to read it about, and, and I am an environmentalist, but most of the stuff that I read that comes out of the industry just turns me off, f full, full stop. Um, so, I mean, how did we, how did we start? And I, I think this all came from our background, but me and Geraldine, we met when we were uh, 18 years old on a disco floor in, in, in Burnley. Uh, not literally on the floor, we were dancing. Um, <laughs> And uh, the first thing that I did was, uh, oh, I haven't got a picture, but the first thing I did was form a band and we came to London. And um, me and Jodine came to London with 50 pounds each in our pockets. I was, we were both 18, I think we were. So it was 19, yeah, 1980 when, when we came down to London. And um, in a band, ran, <coughs> a, long, I'll cut a, a, a very funny story, very short. But I was in a band, we ran out of money. I spent all our rent money uh, on buying a saxophone, which I never learned to play. We. Um, Never learned to play any good anyway. We, um, we were going to be kicked out of our flat. We were literally being kicked out. And we said, right, we've got to, um, we emptied our wardrobes. We just went to our wardrobes, got a load of stuff out of it. My old punk clothes. Jodie had left school at 15 with no qualifications, but she just loved making clothes. 
for her friends and to go and basically she left school at 15 so she could earn some money to make clothes to go out to dance to watch bands and same as me really so we had we had these wardrobes stuffed to fit combination of second hand clothes my old punk clothes Jodie's made clothes we took them down to Camden Market which was it was a part of Camden Market that was just starting we took uh, over that weekend uh, 300 and odd quid the rent for the weekend was 12 quid we with that kind of uh, was a spark amongst us from then on I spent every spare second I had going around every jumble sale every charity shop every auction my nan found out from the local rag and bone man about these things called um, shop Mungo and Shoddy Yards, that's the top right hand corner there, which were basically the prototype recycling yards. They were all in Dewsbury, all. There, were there was eight of them. In Anybody from that area? Anybody remember the, remember the Mungo and Shoddy Yards? No. Well, that, you can, they've still got it on, that's flats now, so you can go around and look and you'll see, you'll see, you'll see these big signs saying Mungo, Mungo and Shoddy, and that's where the word Shoddy clothing comes from. And, and they, were, they were where the rag and bone men used to take, used to take their trucks and their carts, and they'd weigh the clothing, uh, on, onto, a, on, onto a way bridge, then it would go up a conveyor belt to the top floor and there'd be all these old women, you know, well, they weren't, some of them weren't that old, but they, they were, it was very, they were downtrodden women, all with their, all with their headscarves and often with rollers in there and they'd be, they'd be dropping red wool down one, blue wool down another, white cotton down another, accessories down another and then they would either get sorted at the bottom, on the bottom, on the ground, or they would get compressed and either go for, for full-on um, recycling, if, if it was a, if it was 100 wool, it would get made into fresh wool. If it was cotton, it, the same would happen. If it was mixed fibres, it would go as wiping cloths for normally for for garages. And we used to we were the first ones to actually leave examples of all of those things like 1960s dresses, 1950s overcoats, uh, you know whatever old Dr. Martins. We'd leave them with these ladies and say, right, if you save these out rather than stick them down the chutes, we'll pay you 50p for that, pound for that, two pound for that. Uh, and, um, and, and then we'd say to the, the, uh, the shoddy yard owner, and we'll pay more uh, when we weigh our car out uh, for the stuff that we take than you get from recycling. And, um, and we became heroes in all of those eight. And we took two big lorries a week, two, three tonners a week we, we, we used to take. And, and we, would, we would buy a, a cotton dress. We'd, we'd give the, the, the women 50p. We, 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 they told us that we trebled their wages. At the women's wages they were they were all obviously back then there wasn't minimum wage but they were on what, what would have been way below <coughs> minimum wage for the, the the work that they were doing suddenly we transformed we transformed their wages we also made more money for the rag yards uh, and and but we made a fucking fortune <laughs> we, we, we were it, it soon got to the point where we were taking a thousand pounds each a day uh, within within a, a year we were certainly on five thousand pounds a weekend and when we were I was just 20 and Geraldine was 19, so we'd been in London for 18 months. We bought our first house, a three-bedroom Victorian house for cash in northwest London. Uh, we were taking £10,000 a week in cash on, on, on that market from selling, from selling second-hand clothes, from buying it, or, 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 or from there. And my nan used to say, where, where there's muck, there's brass. That was, you know, she's a, she was a Yorkshire lady and, 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 and not, nothing was more, more, true, more true than that. Um, Parallel to that, Geraldine took a stall in Kensington Market, an old <coughs> upcycled bank that was divided into um, a, a whole... Does anybody remember Kensington Market? Yes. I've <laughs> Yeah, do you know Pierce there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> five years ago. Yeah. So, so Kensington, Kensington Market was a place where you'd get your nose pierced, where you'd... It was a basically a, about 40 or 50 shops where you'd pay about £10 a week. It was easy in, easy out, so you'd, you didn't need the bank of mum and dad. You, you, it could be anybody from any background, as long as they had an idea, you didn't need to sign a lease, if, you didn't, if it didn't work, you just stopped going there. And you rented a space, it was a real rabbit run, it looks like a, a health and safety nightmare, doesn't it? But it was in prime London location, Kensington Market then was a, the most, the second most <coughs> important shopping street in London, uh, King's Road was number one, uh, Oxford Street was way, below, was way below those streets back then. And, and in there, so there was, you, Geraldine was right next to somewhere that would, where you could get a piercing and a tattoo done. There was hairdressers, there was lots of women who'd taken their sewing machines in and were making, making little mini clothing collections. Geraldine was one of those. Boy George started there, working in, working in a store with a band called Zig Zig Sputnik. Uh, Ken, um, Freddie Mercury started out there selling dresses before, before, he, before he formed Queen. I could give you a whole list of famous people who started there because 
you, and they're all working class people. You know, a lot of people could, could, could go into these places very different now, you know, now that we've, now it's an electrical store and try being a young person and doing what me and Geraldine did in, in a prime location and forget it. Um, but that's, that's another talk I could do, but that's not today's talk. Um, and, but but the, the great story is that uh, Geraldine got, got an, a, a very famous retailer went in there who we'd never heard of, but they were called Macy's New York. Uh, they, came, they went in there, they ordered 200 of each of Geraldine's styles. She'd made eight, eight styles of clothing. <coughs> she sat there with a sewing machine. I remember saying to her, I said, well, we didn't know who they were. And then she said, well, and I said, you've taken an order for 1,600 pieces and you can make three a day on a quiet day. Um, and, and she said, yeah, but everybody was telling me I've got, I've got to take it because they're such a famous company. Anyway, we, we went to this thing called the BKCEC, the British Net Knitwear, British Knitwear, Clothing, Knit Knitwear and Clothing Export Council. And they said, they asked us, who's your manufacturer? I said, her, and he must have thought we were total, total nutters. So the, again, cutting a story short, my mum left her job working in a bar, in, in, uh, working in a pub in Blackburn. Uh, set up a factory uh, in an old, uh, bought a lot of second-hand um, sewing machines on it from Exchange and Mart, which to you young ones is like eBay, I think. Um, um, uh, we came up with a label, Red or Dead. We um, we became, cut a long story short, we ended up 20, with a 25 million turnover, 380 staff, 23 shops around the world, and we sold it when we were for a shipload of money when we were when we were in our mid 30s, and and that's when we that's when we started Hemingway Design. But I think the reason that we were able to do all that is about is about nurture. Um, it's, you know, you you people don't automatically become thrifty, uh, which which is what our life has stemmed from. And I think back, I think thrift and sustainability go go absolutely hand in hand. If you're thrifty, you're almost certainly going to be sustainable because the first thought of why we use why we take things from a hotel. Uh, which you're allowed to take. We're not nick we are not nicking shower caps. You know, you, we are taking shower. But the first reason why we why we do that to not buy cling film is about thrift. You know, and, and that that comes from that comes from like I said about living the life. And, and my family certain certainly did that to a to the umpteenth degree. You know, my, my granddad would build his own shed out in, in a tiny lean to. Uh, he would he would grow peaches partly for fun, but partly because we would never have been able to afford peaches from our family. Um, you know, toys, every, and I can actually say that every single toy I had was made by me and my pop. So that, and we pack, and this is now. I've, I've got grandchildren now, and this is ready when the when the young uns are, are old enough. This is ready to pass to them. Even the lead soldiers, um, you know, we made our own. Which I know you're not supposed to suck, but I'm sure I've sucked most of the lead at them when I was young, and I'm all right at the moment. Um, so we, we made the soldiers, and we painted them. We made every bit of that. That that's just wallpaper that made it, uh, and. And what you get out of that, what you get out of that, and, and the passion that you feel about, about doing things, making things, all of these things are about sustainability. That they're all about the right way of living, you know. And, and if you can, if, if people can do that, if people can, you know, the idea of going to Hamleys is, is like, what would you do that for? What is the fun in, in what is the fun in going and buying something from from Ham And I'm sure. That people will be thinking, what's he on about? It's great fun, but the, I can tell you now, there is much more fun in a kid building a den or building something like this, and what they get out of that is absolutely phenomenal. And, and what it will teach them about creativity and to be able to do things, and, and what it will teach them about sustainability is everything that you want, them, that what you want society to know and, and to do. Um, I mean, that, uh, that's, that's you know, that's what we now taught with the the uh, the trick of uh, the. The um, shower caps, um, but also my, my, fav my favourite thing is what my nan used to do was when you know when 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 your soap gets so small that you, you don't you actually don't want to wash your bum with it because it gets stuck up there. <laughs> what, 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 we, what we were en what we were en what we were encouraged to do was to put it. We used to keep it uh, in a in a in a pot in the in the, in the bathroom and then tip it into a pan like that. And she would melt it. She would melt it all down. And when it solidified. And when it solidified, uh, she would slice it up, and that was your multicolored soap. And we used to love our multicolored, multicolored soaps. And but, but you know, it all sounds it all it all sounds like oh, what, what a crazy thing to do, but it isn't. It's what it embeds. It's what it's the thinking that it embeds in you. And I'm so proud, you know, that that now we don't think about can we have the flashiest car, but let's make that car last 30 years, you know, because we know that that is the right thing to do. 
Um, it's our house, just, I mean, does that look like a cool designer house? Ish? Every single bit in there is upcycled. There is nothing there that is not, that has been bought new. Uh, and apart from the plant, that's the, only, that's the only thing there. Everything has been bought from junk shops, has been upcycled. Even the sofa has, has been made uh, from old jacket, jacket linings. Um, that's, our, that's our living room, a uh, house that we built <coughs> ourselves. The, the, um, the two sofas are from our boat that are, that are made, uh, that are made <coughs> sailed in a storm and got, it got wrecked, so we didn't, we didn't leave it on Hailing Island, we, we bought it back. And, and those sofas <coughs> were made in 1999. We'll never buy a sofa again in our lives. We don't need to. They're, they're, they're a design classic because they're individual. Um, they're beautiful. We'll obviously have to recover, recover, recover the, the, you know, the, the covers. Uh, the lights there are made from shrunken, uh, uh, from shrunken coffee cups, discarded coffee cups. They've been shrunken in the oven and simply stuck together to to, cre to create giant lights. Um, everything there has been either found or upcycled, and um, and that. That means that the projects that, that we that we take on, and that means that we have absolutely no problem getting projects because people know that we, you know, if we're gonna, if people want something that's interesting doing with, with something old, the Hemingways are gonna do it because it's, emb it's embedded in them. So, for example, like when when um, Bournemouth Council wanted to look at these 1950s um, these 1950s stacked beach huts, which the public wanted to bring them down. They've been there. They've been empty for 17 years. They were kind of just full of pigeons. But we, we can see the beauty in in that rather than the beauty in new because uh, well and they are absolutely beautiful uh, and and we brought them back to life. But it also brought the the whole of the whole of Boscombe Seafront back to life. There's a lot. I can't tell these stories fully, but on, on most of the things that I'm talking about, there will be a blog about them. Uh, there'll be a section of the HemingwayDesign.co.uk website, and there'll be detail. We detail all our projects and about. You know how how we achieve them. So uh, I've only well, we're running late, and I've I've only, I've only got half an hour on this talk. Um, I think I think I've, other th the other thing is if you if you put politics into into your thinking as well, because I don't think that I don't think that the two that sustainability and politics are that far apart at all. And if you think about the big, probably the biggest thing now that we think about when we're, when we're designing and creating something is the fact that there's a generation that is proven for the first time, the millennial, millennial gen generation, are empirically worse off than their parents for the first time that's ever happened. How many people here are 45 and older? So, that, so that's the majority. Am I right in saying that we grew up knowing that we would do better than our parents as long as we put a bit of elbow grease into it. We did not maybe loads, but a bit. And that, that was massively empowering to know that you were probably going to own a, a better house and maybe own it earlier than your parents, that you were gonna you're gonna go on to do better education and you're probably gonna have a better job with a with a higher disposable income. That was is that fair is that a fair thing that you knew when you were sixteen to eighteen? It was kind of a thing that you thought. But now <coughs> and we felt empowered about that and we went on that generation and um, through the 60s and the 70s and created, were a very creative, the, the 60s and the 70s were, were a very creative, and the early 80s were a very, well right up to the 90s really, were a very creative time. And it came out of a generation that was absolutely empowered. Uh, and, and where whichever class you came from, you were probably not disadvantaged because there were the Kensington markets around, there were the Camdens, where you didn't need the, the, the bank of mum and dad. Now that's turned on its head now. Uh, and uh, and but you've got a generation who can't buy houses, who um, won't buy cars and don't need to buy cars because we've got decent public transport. But, but all of these things are making them think thriftily. And we've got, so you, you're pushing on an absolute open door at the moment. They, there's, there's, there's people who haven't got, we went through the 80s and the early 90s where there was ostentatious consumption. You know, we know about the shoulder pad era. We know, we know about all of that because there was, you know, we, we br ship places like Broadgate in the city were, b were built with metal, metal studs around it because only wealthy people were supposed to, to go in those places. All of that's changed. You look at what Argent are doing in King's Cross, there's a whole philosophy changed. And, and, and so the time has come now to embrace that philosophy uh, and to embrace how young people, to use this 
as, as, a, as a way of making sustainability completely embedded. There's never been a time like now. It's, a, it's definitely the easiest time to talk about, to talk about thrift, and to, which I've been talking about saying that thrift and sustainability are the two things that go hand in hand. And there's a whole generation that will never buy houses, have to live thriftily, you know, are buying bikes rather than cars. So it's, it's an amazing time for your industry. There'll, there'll, never be, there'll never be another time like this. And if you, can't, if you can't get your rates of recycling up, your rate that people think that you can't get it embedded into people's minds, then now, then you, then you really are failing as, as, a, as an industry. Um, I'm going to go past, past, well, that is, you know, that is a new generation doing it themselves. That is, that is, that is the Wayne and Geraldine Hemingways of, of 2017, opening places in Margate, bringing Margate back to life, not, not by a council and not by a government, but by, but by doing the same things that we were, that we were able to do, you know, finding these run-down places. And, and, and this whole uh, philosophy, I'd love to talk about the upcycling of Dreamland, but you'll have to read about that because I'm, I'm watching the clock and I realise that there's a panel discussion got to come up. That you push, you, as an industry, you're pushing totally on an open door. The big money in London, so where we work with Argent, who, has anybody seen the, 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 the reimagining of King's Cross over these last few years? And, and what, what, what do you think about it? Anybody got any views on it? No? It's amazing. I think it's, I think it's the, most generous, the most generous bit of uh, urban regeneration that I've seen possibly in my lifetime. In fact, that it, by creating things like Granary Square and paying for, for big free events to go on and, and creating steps down to the canal so that people can enjoy the sunshine. It's, it's an amazing, it, and it's, it completely and utterly sums up, um, it, it completely and utterly sums up where, where we're going at the moment and, 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 and the direction of travel and forward thinking people. We're putting on an event down there. It's, it's come down there on the 22nd and the 23rd of April this month. Uh, and we're doing this thing called the Classic Car Boot Sale. If you're in London, c come and see it. It's, and, and come and experience what, what the way that generosity and sustainability and, and the environment can all, can all go together. Um, and we're also at a time where generosity is, is, is really important. And, and generosity and sustainability go hand in hand. So, for example... Has anybody been in St Pancras Station since it's been done up? It, yeah. it, and the main, I, I'm sure everybody likes it because yeah. it's beautifully done. It's a beautiful piece of design. But also, the interesting, the really interesting thing for me about it is it's become uh, it's the highest grossing retail. They reckon it's the highest grossing retail per square foot site uh, transport interchange in Europe. And they wanted to find out how this was happening because lots of people, including me, will decide to go to St Pancras for a meeting or, or something to eat when we're not actually getting on a train. Now that's, for my generation, that feels really weird because we were brought up with British Rail providing the worst food and, and stations being cold and in, inhospitable. But here you've got something with great food, great shops, and it's a railway station, which is, you know, again, major step forward. But then they wanted to find out what was driving this footfall. And, and they started to, to research, what, you know, what was that, was it the shops, the quality of the food? It, yes, it was all of those things, but the number one thing that people associated with, with St Pancras Station was the pianos. Three pianos that were, were, were put, three, three pianos that were put in there that people can go and, that people can, anybody can go and play. I think John Legend famously, uh, uh, Elton John's donated a piano now to King's Cross and John Legend went and, and played on it week or two ago or something so these things get a life of their own but this is th these this kind of thinking is linked to thrift it's linked to sustainability it's n it's linked to a new way of thinking it's linked to the, the kind of generosity that a new generation have to get through life on and this I'm going to skip that one through time this this weekend um, I, I was in Berlin again has anybody been to Berlin in the, especially the Mitte district recently yeah. So the Mitte district, to tell a story, is, is, is a real story of, about sustainability and, and about upcycling and about this new way, this new way of working. When the wall came down 26 years ago, um, this Mitte district was in East, is in East Berlin, or was in what was East Berlin, uh, and when the wall came down, just the other side of the wall looked like this, basically. Um, it, without, without the chairs, without the bunting, it, it, it was a place that was full of squatters but um, but the squatters weren't 
there, were, there will have been some druggies in there, but mainly they were artists and creatives who were taking cheap spaces and doing stuff in it because it was basically no cost. When the wall came down, the West, West Berlin government, as was, didn't really understand what to do with it, and they, they concentrated on doing the big stuff like getting um, Norman, Sir Norman Foster in to do the Reichstag building and all of that kind of stuff. But what happened in the meantime was that the West German creative community, jo West Berlin creative community, jo joined in with the East Berlin creative community and started to create this really vibrant place called the Mitte District. And, and they started to create vegetarian restaurants, vegan food places, really cool shops, galleries. And, and, and it, just, it started to attract young creative people from all around Europe. In fact, at the moment, there is a bigger flow of young people to Berlin out of London, because London, as we know, is expensive, than there is to Manchester and Birmingham, which is quite amazing to think that young people here are choosing to go to Berlin rather than go, in bigger numbers than they're choosing to go to British cities. It's, I, I was very surprised, but the figures are there to prove that. Um, but then I was, I, was, I was talking about this area and saying, isn't it great that in some parts of, in some parts of Europe there are places where people can do what me and Jerry Dean did. You can't do it in London anymore, we know that. You know, you, you can't do it, you certainly can't do it in, in, in any of the major cities, apart from Liverpool, I think, at the moment. Um, you can't, certainly can't do it at the, at, at the proportion of your income that me and Jerry Dean were able to spend on it. But, but Berlin, you can. And, and when I was doing a talk, an EE an e funded talk, um, and, and there was a, a, a Berlin, what were many more of them, will there, but um, there was a Berlin, there was a Berlin uh, councillor at, at this and he stood up and he said I'm really glad that somebody's talking about this he said because we're so proud of it in Berlin uh, in, in the government of Berlin and he said you know what we call it we call it an absence of government he said we just we just let a generation get on with it and they've created what we consider to be the most exciting part of, of our capital city and, and, and that is what you know I think this industry could do as well You've got to allow. You've got to allow a generation that is already thinking this way, and it, a creative generation that is having to be creative, that is having to be thrifty. How can you embrace what they have to do and make uh, and make that grow? I haven't got the answers for that stood up here, but that but that is, I think is, if I'm not being too obtuse, is the clue to getting more people to to accept to, to accept what you want them to accept. And, and to an extent, it happened in in, in Fish Island in Hackney. Uh, I'm not going to tell that story. It, it's happening in Liverpool, uh, brilliant at the moment around the Jamaica Jamaica Street and the Baltic Quarter, and now in the Ten Streets in the North Docks. If you haven't been to see uh, upcycled Liverpool at the moment, then get up there and see it. It's an amazing city that's that's doing it from grass grassroots up and doing it through creativity. Um, right. I'm going to now, uh, this is where I'm going to struggle. So I'm, I also want to just show how sustainability and fun can go together. So about four years ago, we started this festival called the National Festival of Thrift. And, and it's been, has anybody heard of the National Festival of Thrift? Two people and you're in the, three people and you're in the industry. So this, this event gets four, got 47,000 people to it last year. So it's, it's up. It's up there with the scale. It's one tier down from Glastonbury. There's only, you know, it's the, the, the only events that are bigger than that with more people coming to it are Glas are, is Glastonbury basically, and and it's it's all about sustainability and recycling. Um, but I want to give you a film uh, to show you, and, and we've been going, and it's just getting bigger and bigger each year. It just grows and grows and grows and grows. I'll let let you do it because. And if any of you want to get involved in it, it's a free event. Um, it's we think this idea about having fun. We'll come back to about this thing about having fun anyway. With what kind of... it's absolutely wonderful to have come to this extraordinary site. There is a village, there's woodland, there's a church with a wonderful mausoleum, there's a walled garden. So there are nuts and crannies everywhere. It came from an idea of building a creative community, celebrating upcycling, recycling, but really thinking about how can we live together creatively and share our skills, share our knowledge, and not waste stuff. We realised that there was a need for a national festival that celebrated sustainability, thrift, 
careful living, light touch living. It really is the ultimate community festival on, on a big scale. It's, it's about people, it's about community, it's about us doing things for ourselves. It represents the resilience of Red Car and Cleveland. And won the national, uh, it won the national festival of the year for the Observer and the Guardian. It's won Visit England awards, um, and if anybody wants to get involved, just come and come and join us. You, you can you can either you can either email Hemingway Design info at HemingwayDesign.co.uk or go on the Festival of Thrift website, and there's lots of people there you can contact. So I'm just wrap, I'm just going to wrap up now before. Um, I won't get it working yet. So I was asked to look at you know sent a few things and. You know, hearing that I, I, I had no idea that recycling rates were, were falling, uh, which I, I found that hard to believe. That actually were it's scary, isn't it? That we're actually going backwards. But then, but then when you read things that that, that what, what we allow to happen, you know, that carbon black. Um, you know, how the hell do do we allow the, the, these things to happen? You know, surely there's got to be, you know, there's there's got to be. A, I don't understand why. You know, you can't, this is what you can't recycle, is it? So, why are they allowed to use it? You know, what, I, don't get, I don't get it. If you, why are we in a situation where packaging, which, which we all think is, you know, as a consumer, I, I, it's the first time I'd heard of this as well, I couldn't believe that, that they're actually making fast, you know, food, food like this in packaging that can't be recycled. What are you doing as an industry to... How the hell are they not listening to you? I don't get it. You know, it just I'm sure that if the public knew knew that, and, and I'm surprised that I didn't know it when I'm when I'm this way inclined. It's just it's, it just it shocks me. This 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 shocks me as well. I I would never have thought that you know I just assume completely assume that any plastic like this from your bathroom you can put into into recycling. Not that you have to take the fucking pump out <laughs> because that can't be recycled how the hell in 2017 is that allowed to be to, to happen and i'm sure that if the public knew about it they'd think they'd think everybody involved in the industry was fucking stupid because it is absolutely it, beg, it beggars belief but you only have to start to look you you, on, you only have to look at um you know this this was amazing um this this was on the Avino. This was on their website. Re read it, you know. <coughs> so when I, if I saw that, I I just think, are they are they having a laugh? You know, do they think that's the right thing to say? It's a brand being absolute. They need to be embarrassed for saying that. It's it's thick. It's absolutely <coughs> thick of a brand to say that. And the public are not stupid because you, you start to go down underneath where uh, the comments on their own website, and people are saying that they're stupid. You know, and, and so, are you harnessing are you harnessing this social media to, to then embarrass them? There's, there's so much out there that you could embarrass brands who are doing this with. It's all there. You know, you, you, we we were looking through this, thinking, well, the embarrassment's there. You know, what 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 is the industry what is the industry doing about it? And that that's me finished anyway. I think there's a panel discussion. So thanks for listening. <laughs>